Excuse me, room 203, please? 203. Thank you. Honey, are you scared? Scared. Are you hurt? Hurt. It's, it's called echolalia, miss. I saw this young lady holding the girl's arms very rough. Yes, mostly. and she probably saved her from, from running off. Gloria's stronger than she looks. I, I have absolute confidence in our helper here. Okay, Donna, let's go. I'm sorry, we've wasted your time. You take my daughter to family and children's services? Do you know what those people can do? Is there something we've done that you disagree with? Do, do, do you feel Glory's not being treated well? It has nothing to do with you, Kate. It has nothing to do with this. I, I just don't want you to not like me. What could possibly... Listen, we... We all have made our mistakes. We, we all have our regrets. I know I, I didn't make Glory autistic, but... But when I started to see signs that something was wrong, I... I just couldn't face it. How are you? Thank you so much for being here to talk about this absolutely lovely and very, very topical movie. Thank you for having me. Which airs on Lifetime this Saturday. Yes. But let's start by saying, what drew you to playing Kay? Who, uh, just to let you guys know, I mean, I'm sure you gathered this from the trailer, is the mother of an autistic 11-year-old girl who is going back into the workforce, and her life is sheer chaos in every sense, financially, emotionally, relationship-wise. Right, and is looking for somebody to take mm -hmm. over. And then this lovely girl named Jack, played by Anna Sophia Robb, comes into their lives, um, who happens to be an imposter, has no experience with children with autism, has no experience with children, period. Uh, she's just a runaway child who needs to, uh, tr she tries to get custody of her own sister. And so she comes into our lives and we hire her. Um, and she's doing some unethical things with our child in the beginning, which we don't know about. And then ultimately, she actually has an incredible influence on the kid. Um, but by that time, we find out she's an imposter and there's this big betrayal. It was really kind of about, to me, when you when you tell a story like this about autism, and it's, although the film's really not about autism, it's a film about love and family and connection and not being able to connect and all that. Um, but if you do tackle that subject, you better do it authentically and carefully and with love. And both the women behind this, uh, Janet Grillo, the director, and um, uh, Jennifer Deaton, our writer, have firsthand experience with that. So it's really told very delicately and authentically and uh, beautifully done. And that actually brings me to my next question, because your performance is very understated, where you could have really played it very differently. And as a result, it's not treacly, it's not overwrought, it's not your typical kind of expected arc. How did you approach playing this character? I mean, I, I think that, to, and this is a little bit of what she goes into the character later after w w when you guys stop seeing it, um, is she was in denial about it in the beginning. Um, and then finally when she did admit to herself that something was wrong with her daughter, she went overboard and tried every imaginable method and medicine and, you know, gluten diet. and diet and this and that and the other thing. And I think that's sort of who Kay is and, you know, somebody who just always wants to look for a solution, always is trying to be upbeat about it, always, you know, is looking at the positive side of things. And, and that is kind of where we took her rather than making her a victim or somebody who was completely traumatized by it. It's, you know, was something that was thrown in her path and she loves this child dearly and all she wants to do is come up with solutions for it. And the little girl playing Glory is so incredibly believable. Yeah. How, how did you develop a relationship with her? Well, the great thing about working with Janet, um, who teaches here, by the way, at uh, NYU, um, is that she really spent time rehearsing with all of us. 
And um, that made us, because we had, you know, on an independent film like this, you shoot maybe 20, 24 days at most. And you go right into it normally, and you just don't have time to become a family and do all the other. Well, there's some times when that's great because you work with people you're not supposed to know, but in an instance like this where you're really supposed to be a tight-knit family, you want to spend time together. And so we did that, and it was really, it was pretty amazing because it helped so much for all of us to understand the dynamic that you all get in a family. You become a certain, you, you start fulfilling a certain role in a family. Do you remember the moment when it all clicked for you? I think it's really when we started filming, then it really always, to me, comes together. In the rehearsal period, you're playing, you're doing things, you're trying out stuff and seeing what works, what doesn't work. And then when the camera starts rolling, that magic can really happen. So when Or you, not. But or, or not, yeah, it depends. Never know. But when you read the script, what about it spoke to you? I think it was just the the honesty uh, with which the story was told and the the character struggles and that each character had sort of his or her own journey to go through. Very often in the script, I find that you see the protagonist who has this great arc and then everybody else is sort of serving that character and that's about the extent of, you know, when they're on screen and the protagonist is not on screen, you'll see them talking about that character. But in this case, it was everybody had kind of their own storyline. Um, so that was a, a definitely a good selling point to me. You know, it's interesting. We hear so much about how there aren't really well-developed roles for women out there, and they're so hard to find. It's a needle in a haystack. And I feel like you've had quite the year between this, how to get away with murder, which we can talk about since the season finale. Yeah. Thank you. Since the season finale aired, so yeah. we're not going to get slammed for any spoilers. No. And then this lady here is going to be in the spinoff the, of The Blacklist. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. We ch we've just been filming. Um, I'm on two episodes of The Blacklist, and the last one being, um, or their 22nd episode being the one which is sort of meant as the pilot episode for a potential spinoff with Ryan Eggold and I where I would sort of be, in essence, a female kind of Reddington, and he would maybe be the, you know, I mean, our d the dynamic between us, it's a better way of saying it, is, is kind of like the Reddington and Elizabeth Keene kind of dynamic. And um, so we have to find if we're going to find out if we're going to be picked up, um, as all pilots need to do, but it's kind of like a, it's called a backdoor pilot. Um, and it's a really pretty awesome character, Scotty. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you guys, if you watch The Blacklist, you can tell how duplicitous and interesting um, some of these characters are, like James Spader's character. And she's kind of like the female James Spader, even though she's a CEO of a, um, a company um, and not an actual criminal, but with criminal tendencies if needed. <laughs> and when do you find out? I mean, I, we're, I, the assumption, obviously, being that it will get picked up. I mean, the show is doing we would so well. find out, I guess, whenever all the other pilots are announced, which is the upfront time soon. Well, good luck. Not that you'll need it. Thank I you. somehow, we'll I somehow doubt there will be an issue. But how did you come to do uh, How to Get Away with Murder? I was just approached, and I really loved uh, the character. And I thought that it was so great to see that with um, Viola Davis. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, she's such a powerhouse as an actor and that character on the show obviously and um, you don't see it much I think on that show that they have somebody who comes who's really kind of face to face with her or that brings out that kind of softness in her in the way that my character I think did uh, so I really like the arc that they came up with it was actually meant as a two episode they just wrote these two episodes they presented it to me and I had a window to do it in and I said okay and then they said, oh, okay, would you do more? And I go, sure. And so it just kind of kept, kept going. And then um, I shot a movie in between, and they worked around those dates because I did this little film with um, Giancarlo Esposito, which he directed and also starred in, and, and Josh Dumal. Um, and it's called This Is Your Death, and it's very twisted about a reality TV show where people commit suicide. Um, which is really not that far from where we're heading at this point anyway. Agreed. Anyway, Agreed. I'm actually yeah. surprised no one's come up with that Crazy. yet. Or maybe they haven't. It mm -hmm. hasn't been greenlit. Yeah. So what went through your head when you saw the first How to Get Away with Murder script? I just thought, 
because I mean, that was a great entrance. Let's let's yeah, be real. Yeah, really amazing <laughs> way to introduce a character, and I think that um, I just love that on network television we've come such a you know such a long way where where they can do things like that and. Uh, a lesbian inter interracial relationship between two characters on network television. I think a couple of years ago, people would have said, oh, absolutely not going to happen. And now it does. So it's awesome. She and Viola Davis kissed on air for those who didn't see it. And it was real and it was spectacular. Mm -hmm. What is Viola Davis like to work with? Amazing. I mean, yeah, definitely a little intimidating because... <laughs> You come in, it's like, oh, whoops, Oscar, Emmy, whatever. You know what I mean? Like, she's just so talented and powerful and strong. And so I just kind of threw myself into it and hoped for the best. And it's kind of how I go through life anyway. Is that how you approach the roles that you, anything, you get? Everything anything? I do, because if I start really thinking about it, I'll never get out of bed. I would be too scared or too intimidated or whatever. So the only way forward is to sort of take the plunge and then hope that it's going to work out. I do a lot of work. It's not like I just show up, <laughs> but I don't. What, what's been the scariest role you've ever taken on? The one that deep down inside you, you were thinking, I can't do it, I can't do it, but you did it anyway, I, and it worked out. Strangely, I actually think Goldeneye, um, because it was a departure for me. It was a very much the beginning of my career. And as the Bond movie, uh, GoldenEye, obviously Pierce Brosnan. And um, it was such an outgoing, crazy, possessed, weird woman, Russian, um, that I just didn't know if I could do it because I'm pretty shy by nature. And then I just, it was one of those things. I just like, all right, what do I have to lose? I'm just going to throw myself into it and, and do it. And now you're in the Canaan as a Bond girl, right. Bond lady. <laughs> let's let's be, yeah, you know, very classy. What are your memories of uh, X Men? Oh. Because she was the original Jean Grey. Yes. What? Which I guess now, thank you. <laughs> I guess now we have to say original Jean Grey. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the original Mystique and earlier this week. So. Oh, you did, Rebecca. Yeah, Rebecca, Rebecca. the fabulous Rebecca. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it was amazing. I was part of that franchise for 14, 15 years or something like that. And I have died and come back more than anybody ever on screen, I would imagine. I mean, it's... Well, J.R. Ewing, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of crazy. What, what movie do you think you did that changed your life? When you look back. And you mean me personally or just... Both personally and professionally. professionally. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think I, I can say that. I mean, definitely in professionally, you know, the, the Bond movie was a big deal because I was an unknown before that, and it kind of put me out in the spotlighting and gave me some options I didn't have before. Not that I didn't have to fight or I'm not still fighting. Um, but for me, I think when I worked with Woody Allen and Robert Oldman both, and I think it was almost in the same year, that really felt like, you know, a, somebody was born and raised in Holland who was a model, who was not a Bond girl, who was like, you know, in X-Men movie. Like, I just felt never in my life am I going to be taken seriously and are people are going to give me real parts with real directors. And so for me, those were milestones. Yeah, I think Altman and Woody Allen are pretty huge. Pretty I would big. have to agree with that. Yep. And here we are today. So yes. what can you tell us? Back to the blacklist, because I'm kind of obsessed. You're obsessed. I think I told you what I can't That's say. That's all you can and say? I, it's, well, you can't yeah. tell us the first script, the first uh, episode? No. I'm just why? <laughs> I ruin it, right? Yeah. Other than it's pretty good. So I really hope that um, you guys get to see what, you know, the goodness and the, um, the interesting part of it's such a great character. Who's more intimidating to work alongside, James Spader or Viola Davis? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> They're both pretty intimidating. Um, yeah, my first day with James, I was definitely a little bit like, I, I think I was sweating a little. Um, but then it just went away. When you get a script, do you go on instinct? I do. Sometimes I think about it a little bit more than others because some are a no-brainer. You just go, great script, great character, great director, great actors. I'm in, I don't even have to think about it. 
And sometimes there's one part that's overpowering, but the others you're not really sure about. And then either, you know, you just have to take that leap of faith or or not do it. And, you know, I like to work. I just love to work. I like to be busy. I'm happiest when I work. So most of the time I'll say yes and try it. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. So you don't sweat it. You just put your hands in the, put yourself in the hands of the director and see what happens. Yes. Well, that doesn't mean that I always listen to a director. I also do my own thing. And <laughs> if I feel that they're not exactly telling me what I want, but it, I mean, it, it, I don't want it to become a fight, obviously, but it, I think it's good to come in with a lot of ideas of how you see your character and what you want to do, and hopefully you see face to face. In terms of research with this specific movie, because of the subject matter and so much has been written about autism, what research did you do? Well, in this case, because we had Janet and, and Jennifer, our writer and director, um, we had so much information av available to us already. I mean, I did watch documentaries, and we went to various schools for research and all of it. But to me, the most valuable was actually spending time with both of them because they had so many stories, and there was so much that to, to draw from. And then I think all of us at this point in our lives probably know somebody who has a child with autism because it's just so prevalent. So, and certainly in my environment, I've definitely come across it. And that movies like this really live or die by the relationship that a character like you has with the child. And I feel like your relationship here is very authentic and it really showcases the love and I would say the, the resentment she feels a lot of the time that this is her life. So how did you forge that bond? This was really, I think, in the in the in the rehearsal period, and then it's also that I really believe that chemistry to me is not something that is this mysterious thing that happens or doesn't happen, which I think a lot of people believe. I mean, and sometimes yes, it goes like that. Sometimes you meet somebody, you have instant chemistry, and sometimes there is none. But it, that moment when there isn't any, you still you're an actor. You got to make it happen. So. It, it was just knowing what that relationship was like and making sure that, you know, there was were all those layers in there. That is, these are things that you have to plant in there. You got to do them. You don't just wait for the miracle to happen or something. So what did you do? I mean, did you guys go out to dinner? Did you? We all, yeah, we all hung out um, in my apartment. I live in New York, so, uh, and we shot here. So we, uh, that kind of became the place where we, in the beginning, had... It was the clubhouse, basically? The clubhouse, yeah. In the beginning, we had um, uh, meetings with Janet and Jennifer, and we talked about the script and talked about the character and gave her notes and did all, you know, just tried to tweak it and make it more authentic to to what I wanted to play, and what, what both Janet and I, how we saw her, and then you know introducing the other characters to the bunch, and then having these rehearsal times, and just spending time with each other. I did a movie years ago, a long time ago, with um, John Favreau. He didn't direct that one actually. It was called Love and Sex, and um, that was directed by a woman named Valerie Brayman. And we spent. I was staying in LA in a hotel. And we spent the week before that in the hotel room of mine, just, you know, she's like, all right, you guys got to get to know each other. And on the first evening, she literally sent this out and she said, because we're playing a couple who's been together for years and years in a relationship. So she said, okay, you guys go out. And so I get in the car with, with John Favreau and he goes, um, do you drink? And I go, no. And he goes, I don't know what to do with you. And so I'm like, okay, uh, I like to dance. He's like, Oh, he goes, okay, I haven't been there in years, and I'm already sweating thinking about it, but he took me to this place where they shot swingers. And so we went swing dancing together, which I'd never done, but it was such a great way of getting to know somebody because you have to trust them. He had to lead me. Like, there was all this intimacy and blah, blah, blah. So I think things like that help enormously. They go, you know, a little, one evening like that probably gave us, like, you know, years of history on film. So I would say for any struggling filmmaker, you know, I know that generally producers are like, no rehearsal period, it's too expensive, we don't have the actors, we don't have the space, we don't, it, it's really crucial, I think. Because especially since most films are shot out of sequence, and if your first day on set, you're doing a love scene, and that's also your yeah, first time meeting the person, yeah, I, I, that's, <laughs> I can't imagine anything more awkward yeah. than that. Yes. So, if you would like to elaborate, no, I'm just kidding. 
that was well, good. <laughs> I've I've had that has certainly happened to me. We're like, oh, nice to meet. What's your name? Okay, let's go in bed and you know, I've never been naked, so don't go Google it or whatever the hell. Or, but it's, but I've I've been in situations where you have to do a love scene with somebody, and yeah, it's weird and uncomfortable. For it's for budgetary reasons, I assume at this point that rehearsals usually don't happen. I think mostly, yeah. But there's also a lot of directors I've worked with who are just, they don't understand acting, I don't think. They just come over to you and like, oh, okay, could you just do it a little faster? I'm like, okay, that's a great note. Um, acting is a mysterious profession to a lot of directors, so you really need to get a director who understands the process and wants to go into this and, and realizes what the value of it is, too. What's the value of it to you? Everything. I mean, I directed my own movie, so I know. And it was actually probably the hardest part for me, ironically, was working with the actors because it was one of the things that I focused on least because I thought, nah, it's easy. I know how to, you know, I've been doing acting for so long, I'm good, I don't have to worry about that. So it was like, okay, the shot and this and the, you know, storyboarding and all that kind of stuff. It puts in location scout, like everything got all my attention. And then there were, were the actors. And then they had ideas. I was like, what do you mean? You're just going to stand there. You're going to say that. You're going to, you know, I became like the Nazi director I never wanted to work with. So that is something that, you know, in my next movie, hopefully, we'll get a lot more time. Um, we also, d we didn't, I, Mila Jovovich was my lead and she wasn't available to us till like two or three days before shooting. And so we had very little rehearsal period, unfortunately. And that was, I think, hurt us in the end because it's her and her son in the movie. And they really needed to have a very strong bond. And now to our audience, please. I'm sure you guys have questions. Hi, Fonfka. Big fan. Um, you actually just said my question. I was going to ask you, after directing Bringing Up Bobby, do you plan to direct again? Yeah. I optioned a book that I'm adapting right now called Dark Rooms. Um, and it's uh, written by Lily Anolik, and she uh, was kind enough to put her trust in me, and so that is hopefully what I'll be directing next. And actually, I'm reading that book right now, coincidentally. Oh, you it's are. amazing, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great, It's an right? amazing yeah. book. It's a kind of a dark, twisty yeah. thriller. Yeah. Thriller, yeah, with a murder in it, two young girls. Hey, uh, thanks for being here. Um, so. GoldenEye is actually one of my favorite movies, and Pierce Brosnan is one of my favorite James Bonds. It's crazy to think it's been over 20 years ago now. What was it like working opposite of him and having those intense scenes? As I look back at some of the stuff you guys did and was incredible for its time. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I just didn't even, I didn't think I had much time to think about it. I was, I was cast, and on the first day of filming, I think they already had, or my first day of filming at least, they already had 300 people at the press over to show them the sets, to do a press conference with us and all of that kind of stuff. And I barely figured out how I was going to play this part and all of a sudden I was catapulted into this strange Bond world where, you know, press is just, I mean, it's insane, the amount of press that's part of it. So I just, I just did it and and really it was sort of like this this is a make or break moment I just have to go for it and I shouldn't hold back and if I fail you know I'll be I'll be one of the many bond girls that nobody ever heard from again and if I go past this it's a miracle so that's kind of how I was looking at it <laughs> Hi, love your work. Uh, just Thank curious, you. what would you say is, is one of the most uh, both professionally and personally fulfilling characters that you've portrayed? Hmm. Well, I liked that movie I referenced, Love and Sex, just because it was something I never have been able to do as much on screen because it's a, it was a romantic comedy um, and not the sugar-coated version. So it was, and working with Favreau was great, and it was, I just got to be more quirky, and I think, in, and, you know, a little bit more maybe in the way that I am in real life, because these other characters are so sort of, you know, larger than life, or totally mentally crazy, like the woman from Hemlock Grove that I played, or, I mean, you name it, I seem to be, like, they want to cast crazy, they come to me. Or have come to me. Well, so. you have dark hair, so that means you're. The way? You have dark hair. I have so dark hair. I'm tall. You're you crazy. Know. I'm crazy. <laughs> so, um, 
Yeah, I, you know, but I, I think Jean Grey, I've played for so long too, so I would definitely put her in part of, you know, as part of that answer. And our last question, over here please. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, do you keep in touch with any of your X-Men co-stars and do you have current X-Men actors reaching out to you asking for advice? Sophie Turner actually reached out to me very sweetly um, to ask for some pointers because she was going to be, you know, stepping into the Jean Grey role. And I said, you don't need any. You're perfect. You're great. You know, go and have a ball. Um, and I can't wait to see the movie. Uh, I've, they've, we've become friends over the years. Some of our, you know, some of my co-stars from the X-Men movies because we have spent so many years together over time between actually filming each movie, like about five to six months, doing the press for them, traveling the world. I mean, we've, got, we've seen each other through divorces, people having children, you know, oh, God knows what crap will happen to all of us. So it was just a, uh, it, you just become some kind of weird dysfunctional family. Um, and Hugh, of course, I've worked with a lot because I've also been part of the Wolverine uh, movie with him. So yeah, it's. It's, it's great. They're really an, an amazing group of people. And I'm excited to see that they're introducing these younger characters. The only thing that I would like to add is that the older men and younger versions of themselves, or older men, I shouldn't say that, because both, um, I don't think that uh, Ian or uh, Patrick would be very happy with that comment. I'm going to rephrase that. The more handsome, distinguished, distingu distinguished, mature man um, are allowed to have their younger versions in the same movie at the same time, or the younger versions are allowed to have the older version, ah, um, distinguished versions at the same time. But with the women, we just get taken out, and the younger one comes in. So I think somebody has to raise that, hopefully, and say, how about you know we have Jean Grey at both ages? Why not? I think that's a great idea. But there is no sexism in Hollywood. <laughs> we all know that. That's please. That, that was resolved years ago. Yeah. And when can people see this? Um, this was out in the theaters and uh, now on Lifetime Saturday, this Saturday, the 23rd at 8 p.m. You can watch it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.